This podcast is brought to you by eRadio. For more podcasts, check out our website at eradiosa.com or download the eRadio SA app from the Google Play Store. Enjoy. It's time for Medical Monday and we're joined by Dr. Dylan Joseph, ophthalmologist, who today is going to tell us all about blended vision. Dr. Hello. Hey there, Ian. How's it going? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, very well. Thank you. Long day in the office and uh, yeah, I look forward to chatting about a hot topic. It's um, also, like last week's one, quite a confusing topic and uh, it takes quite a lot of counseling and preparation to get uh, patients through it, but it's worth it in the end. Now, let's uh, dive right into it. What exactly is blended vision? Well, blended vision is a, an approach we use. Um, to vision correction. So it can either be in the form of laser vision correction, it can be in the form of a customized lens exchange, where we remove your normal, or not normal, crystalline lens when it has dysfunctional lens syndrome, or for people that have cataracts. But these patients generally are above the age of 45. Now, if you remember way back to one of the first two episodes, we discussed something called presbyopia. Yeah. So presbyopia is your uh, lack of your near vision, your reading vision. So the arm is too short. Um, so when we look at optics and the correction of both distance and near, we are able to do that with premium lens technologies that have design built into it that, uh, that gives you distance and near vision. But we cannot do that on the cornea. We can't create a multifocal cornea with when we're doing laser. And a lot of patients as well are not perhaps good candidates for multifocal or premium lenses when we're considering lens surgery, but they are candidates for lens technology that allows something called blended vision. So basically, blended vision is where we show you which eye your brain chooses for distance vision, because everyone by default has a sensory distance dominant eye, meaning that your brain prefers a good sharp quality image out of either the left or the right eye. And we have ways to test that. People used to think that doing the triangle test, I don't know if you've ever done it, you hold your hands up, form a triangle, you look through the center of the triangle with both eyes open, and then you close your left eye and close your right eye. And then the eye that causes the image to jump, depending on what you're focusing on, that's your non-dominant eye, so your brain doesn't like that. But that's a that's a gross way of, of determining which eye is preferred for uh, distance, but it's not how we test it. We want to know from a sensory perspective, a visual sensation perspective, which eye does the brain choose for distance. So we show you at the office which one it chooses, and then by default, the other eye is then your non-dominant eye, which we can then set for a range of near to intermediate visual tasks. So in blended vision, the eyes are being used to see at different visual distances, but we never use one eye at a time, do we? We're never just seeing with the left eye or just seeing with the right eye. The brain uses both eyes simultaneously. So if the surgeon gets blended vision right, the brain is able to see a range of vision, a full functional range of vision from reading at 40 centimeters to potentially the computer at 60 centimeters to infinity. And that is why we call it blended because we're not just targeting either distance or just near vision in both eyes. Some patients choose to have that done and are perhaps not even good candidates for blended vision. So we can show you that as well. Are you potentially a good candidate for blended vision? So blended vision is, is, is something that we use when people are looking for more spectacle independence that are not necessarily candidates for technologies that are going to give you balanced vision in both eyes for reading and for distance. So quite a complex um, concept, but we try and make it as easily understandable as possible when you're face to face with us. Dr. Joseph, uh, what are the phases of adaption of blended vision? Interestingly, if um, uh, people have worn what we call monovision contact lenses uh, throughout their youth, their 20s, 30s, 40s, their brain adapts to that monovision. But monovision is not true blended vision. 
Monovision contact lens wear can only set your one eye for reading and the other eye for distance. So you lose the gap on the intermediate vision, the intermediate range being about 60 centimeters. But if a person wears these contact lenses long enough, your brain slowly starts adapting to this. So there's a very easy transition for when we're doing, for example, blended vision laser. And in blended vision laser, we can preserve the intermediate and the near functionality. And then in the other eye, give you distance. So their adaptation to that is very quick because they've been used to it. However, not everyone uh, that is over 45 and would like to be spectacle independent and is using contact lenses tries this monovision or the blended vision scenario. So when we show you the blended vision option face to face, I get a very good idea clinically for whether you're going to tolerate this um, after the surgery has been done. And in certain cases, we can even show you then what blended vision is and how it functions on a day-to-day -day basis by fitting you with the contact lens trial for three or four or five days to make sure that you're happy with this blended vision before committing to surgery. The phases of adaptation are classically four. So initially, when a person comes in after either having laser, as I've said, or a customized lens exchange or cataract surgery, it's a wow factor. So they sit there on day one, they say, wow, I can read, I can see the computer, I can see distance. Mm. Their brain is flooded with impulses. It's flooded with information. It can suddenly see, it's suddenly delighted. And that, that wow phase or the delight phase is usually uh, in the region of one day to one week. Okay. They then start going through a phase called rivalry. Now, rivalry is where the brain says, hang on, hang on, hang on. My one eye has, is doing more on the computer in the air, but the other eye is doing more on the distance. And I'm sitting at the computer for three to four hours a day. And when I look up, everything's fuzzy. Or when I drive, things are a little bit fuzzy. And then I look down at the dash and I can see clearly. So what, it, what, what is happening is the, the signals are being crossed, so to speak. And the brain is realizing that the eyes are now doing separate things. So they are fighting against each other. So we call this the rivalry phase. And, and mm. typically, this can last up to about um, three months after surgery. And then we, we can talk about uh, um, uh, some neuro adaptation exercises. I'll tell you about that later um, to help you through the rivalry phase. Then you enter a phase called suppression where the brain now realizes, okay, you know what? I don't actually need much input from my left eye for this visual task at distance and I and I don't need my right eye's visual input for the task at near so I start slowly switching it off it's almost like a, a, a light switch yeah um, where the brain r realizes to move from first to second gear, gear it's getting your clutch accelerator control right it's learning how to drive again it's rewiring itself that's the amazing thing about plasticity of the neurons of the brain plasticity meaning it's moldable we can even train the brain, yes, at the, at the ripe old age of 80, of 75, of 60, we can, we can teach ourselves to adapt to this. So the, the, uh, the brain starts suppressing the image, so this, the, the visual comfort factor starts feeling better. That can last another three months or so. And then the fourth phase is what we call true blend or blended vision, where suddenly, you know, how you were learning how to drive would stall the car, you know, 14 times before getting from first to second or pulling off from the stop street. Hmm. And now you don't think about it. It's an automated response. Yeah. So blended vision in the majority of people becomes automated, where they're changing from first to second gear without having to think about it. Um, and that's when the blend becomes natural. So we give our patients a lot of counseling. We send a five-minute video package on what is blended vision. We, we send a five-minute video package on what are neuro um, exercises or brain training exercises to help you get through those phases of um, rivalry, suppression, and then eventually blend to a point where you're happy. Um, and n more than 95, 97% of people that, that have blended vision have very good functional vision and after nine months to a year are happy with their visual outcome. Doctor, it's just amazing how the brain just adjusts everything and uh, adjusts according to everything. I think it's it's amazing. The brain is is just amazing. You've just reminded me how amazing the human brain is. But let's say now, for instance, what happens if I can't adapt? So there are um, a number of patients that that struggle 
uh, but the ones that can't adapt, fortunately, are, are few and far between. In, in those first three to six months, if we see a patient, and we see them as many times as you need to, if you're struggling, you give us a phone call, you write us an email, you come and sit with me, and we'll work you through this adaptation phase. When, when there's this rivalry, as I said, the, the brain is getting two images. It's getting blur from the one eye and clear image, image from the other. So let's say, hypothetically, I've treated your right eye for distance and your left eye more for the, for the computer and your cell phone. All right? So I say to patients, all right, if you're doing cell phone work, which eye is the eye that is doing most of the activity? It's your left eye. So you're getting image blur from the right eye. So what you do while you are doing your near work, put your hand over your right eye, the eye that is giving you the blurred image anyway, and read. Now you're using your left eye. The brain is getting all the input. It's wiring all the visual stimulus to the left eye. And you're reading comfortably. And you read for two or three minutes, and then you slowly take your hand away from your right eye. So what you're trying to tell your brain is continue just sending the stimulus to my left eye. Keep the visual input to my left eye. It's not going to work in the beginning because suddenly there's going to be a little blur when you take your hand away from your right eye and your brain's going to get confused and say, oh, uh, mm. no, what do I do now? But the more you practice that, and that's what we call brain training exercises, the more you get used to the fact that when you remove that hand from your right eye, suddenly it's not uncomfortable visually because the brain has suppressed that image. It's not that it shuts it off. It doesn't go dark, but it suppresses it. It's like a light switch that just suppresses that um, image for near, and you, you, you become comfortable with your reading vision, and vice versa. So if you're doing a distance activity or watching TV, for instance, um, you can occlude your left eye, which has been set for your near. So suddenly your brain is driving all the visual input to the right eye, which is the distance activity, and it's saying, I'm comfortable. Do this for two or three minutes and then remove the hand from in front of your left eye. So you're telling your brain to just switch off the impulses, shut it down so it doesn't need that blurred image. And eventually um, it becomes, uh, as I said earlier, like driving a car, moving it from first to second gear um, and clutch accelerator control. Uh, and, and, and often when we, when we tell our patients to do those exercises, it speeds up the process and it gives them more confidence because they can see that there's improvement. When, when I was studying ophthalmology, we have to use an instrument to look at the back of the eye. And I'm left eye dominant. So I could easily look at the back of a left eye and my brain could suppress the image from my right eye because you have to keep the other eye open. So I could see a clear image. But when I swapped that around and for the first, gee whiz, six months, nine months of my registrar time, I try and use my right eye to look at the back of the, a, a patient's right eye. But I couldn't see anything. It was blurred because mm. all the visual stimulus was going to my left eye still. My brain was saying, hey, what are you doing? So what you do is you occlude that left eye for a while. You rewire it, the impulse. The brain can pick up an image, and then slowly you take your hand away. And it, it was like clockwork. One day, it just all clicked into place, and I didn't have to think about it. Um, wow. that's, the, that's the, as you said earlier, the amazing plasticity of the brain. Yes, yes, phenomenal. Now, Doc, the next question, when would I still need to use specs after getting blended vision? Very good question. So a lot of patients for the full uh, functional range, if they uh, achieve that after surgery, don't need it. We do always warn everyone that with blended vision, as with multifocality, there's always a compromise. It's just where can you um, tolerate it visually? And your compromises with blended vision would be one in the adaptation phase. So you've got to really be confident about pushing through it. Uh, secondly, I always warn people that their uh, distance viewing, for example, TV viewing and low lighting at night and driving at night, generally where the problem is. Because the one eye is set more for near, now it's got nothing to do with suppression. It's got to do with the fact that as the light rays travel through the eye, it, um, the light rays fall short of the back of the eye, which creates halos, it creates glare. So that may bother people under those lighting circumstances. So driving at night and TV viewing at night. And in those scenarios, I say to my patients, if you wear spectacles after blended vision, most of the time it will be for that activity. And the majority of people are very happy on that compromise because they know then for their day-to-day -day activities, um, you know, in and around the office, the sports field, they've got a great um, a blended vision scenario, 
And if they have to put on a pair of specs for driving, be it during the day to feel more comfortable and balanced, or at night and in low lighting uh, scenarios, then they're usually pretty happy to, to do that. Fantastic. So that's blended vision done and dusted for today on Medical Monday. Dr. Joseph, for more information, how do we get in touch with you? Jan, um, we are based in Neisner. Our uh, office number is 044-150-0085 and uh, Mariska will be happy to answer your uh, questions and take your calls. Um, our website is www.drdillonjoseph.com. Um, we are also on um, social media, so we have a Facebook page, we have a Twitter and Instagram page, and we've uh, recently uh, launched a um, YouTube uh, page where we've got a lot of the informative videos on vision correction, LASIK, cataract surgery. We've got our videos uploaded, which explain uh, blended vision, neuroadaptation. Um, so go and check it out. And if you've got any questions, feel free to uh, send us an email or give us a phone call. Fantastic online presence, Doc. Well done. <laughs> uh, thanks, Simon. Well, Leon. Awesome. Great man. <laughs> Look That's forward it. to the next time. Exactly. Sure. Yeah. Until next week. Yeah. Thank you so much. This podcast was brought to you by eRadio. For more podcasts, check out our website on eradioessay.com or through the eRadio Essay app from the Google Play Store. <laughs>